Today's program, Should the City Too Busy to Hate Be Divided, explores the ramifications of a Georgia GOP-backed proposal to DNX Buckhead from the city of Atlanta. This proposal is pushed by legislators who do not represent the rep residents of Buckhead or Atlanta. And this alone raises eyebrows about both motive and Republican willingness to follow long established legislative protocols. Our panelists include women who represent both the Buckhead area and the city of Atlanta, as well as the ranking Democrat on the House Governmental Affairs Committee, which will be tasked with reviewing the proposal. We are pleased to be joined by SD 36 Senator Nan Orock, Chair of the Atlanta City, Atlanta Senate Delegation. SD 39 Senator Sonia Halpern represents both Buckhead and portions of Southwestern Atlanta and is Vice Chair of the Atlanta Senate Delegation. HD 54 Rep Betsy Holland is Chair of the Atlanta House Delegation and her district includes most of Buckhead, as well as HD 82, Representative Mary Margaret Oliver, the ranking Democrat on the House Governmental Affairs Committee. To frame our discussion, let's begin by asking Senator Nan Orock, who in her younger days participated in the 1963 Civil Rights March on Washington, how the concept of dividing Atlanta flies in the face of Atlanta's role as the city too busy to hate which was established decades ago. Good afternoon and thank you, Melita, uh, for bringing us together and thank you for that question. Uh, you know, Atlanta, that's true, has long had the brand of the city too busy to hate and it has stood out in the South uh, uh, with that banner head. Um, and the challenge uh, we all face, of course, is to continue to strive for that reality to become uh, its fullest manifestation here in Georgia's capital city. Now, Atlanta attracts people and, and businesses from all globe to relocate here, certainly from across the 50, the other uh, uh, 49 states. In fact, our city has grown by almost 40,000 people just in the past decade. And this secession scheme to remove Buckhead from Atlanta flies in the face of who we are. That's why it's so offensive to me. And you know, uh, listen and learn, there has never been a DNA of a Georgia city in the entire history of our state. A neighborhood from a city has never been done before. I just wanna underscore that here in Georgia. And this very notion, uh, as I said, is offensive to us and to our brand for which we're known nationally, the city too busy to hate. Dangerous precedent. We're uh, lifting our voices to oppose it. And I, I say to you, doesn't history show us? Secession schemes don't work out well in the end. Let's keep Atlanta together. Thank you, ma'am. Senator Halpern, you represent citizens in both Atlanta and Buckhead. Atlanta area legislators have written to both the House Speaker and Lieutenant Governor asking them to reject this proposal, which was made by legislators from outside the area. Please share what you're hearing and your thoughts on what motivates these proposals. Well, hello, everybody. First, um, let me just say that not every Buckhead resident is for the idea of cityhood. I talk to plenty of people who do not agree that this is the right path forward. Um, but what I am hearing fairly consistently from people, frankly, throughout the city is both fear and frustration. And I do believe that those are two important drivers of this Buckhead cityhood movement. Um, Buckhead residents are scared because they don't feel as safe as they they used to with crime going up alongside the rest of the city. Um, and even though we know, all know that most violent crime takes place between people who know each other, it's those random acts of violence like what happened at Lenox Mall or even in the Peachtree Battle Shopping Center that have people on edge. When you add that to the frustration um, that people are feeling that city leadership isn't doing enough to fix infrastructure, so things like potholes and sidewalks and some delays in standard city services, like garbage and debris pickup, what you get is a group of people who decide that a Buckhead City is the answer. Um, it's important, though, to recognize that the people leading this effort, 
in the legislature do not live in Buckhead, nor do they live in Atlanta. And that the CEO of the Buckhead Exploratory Committee himself has only lived in Atlanta for two years. So the people who are most vocally pushing this really don't have an understanding or regard for the Atlanta way which is the very thing that has made this city and the region as successful as it's been all of these years. Atlanta has always found a way to work through its problems, pulling together people, whether they're politicians, elected, civic leaders, religious leaders, business leaders, we have always pulled together to resolve our issues and grievances. And, um, and, it's, and it's my sense that and appreciation for what that has ultimately meant for the city of Atlanta is being disregarded by the by the folks who are so aggressively pursuing this. Thank you. Representative Holland, your entire district is geographically located in Buckhead. And driving around, it kind of seems like there's more Buckhead city signs in some neighborhoods than even for candidates in the upcoming municipal elections. Are those promoting Buckhead as a city basing their campaign on fear of crime rather than revealing the true and complicated impact of separating from the city. So I want to start by talking about and addressing this fear of crime and crime is a very serious issue for us right now in the entire state of Georgia. And I don't want anything I'm going to say next to downplay that I just want to put into context what we're dealing with from a public safety perspective. And I'm going to mostly talk about violent crime because that's what's most concerning right now. It's cities and towns throughout the state of Georgia are experiencing this uptick in violent crime. So about half of the homicides, a little less than the homicides, less than half of the homicides that happen last year happened in those core five metro counties, Clayton, Cobb, Gwinnett, Fulton, DeKalb. And that's about a third higher than they were the year previously. The other half of homicides were happening in other parts of Georgia, and they're up more than 20% than they were that year previously. So we're not talking about something even specific to Atlanta. In Atlanta, zone two, which is my police zone, the one that is um, all Buckhead is in, is right now the safest police zone in the entire city of Atlanta. So while you might have a homicide rate of 12 out of 100,000 right now in Buckhead, you have a rating of about 30 out of 100,000 in other parts of Atlanta. And by the way, of those 12, four of those homicides were the spa shootings that happened about a mile from my home that were so, um, so much in the news. So, and virtually as Sonia Halpern and Senator Halpern was saying, virtually none of the victims of crime, of violent crime in Buckhead live in Buckhead, nor do the perpetrators. So we obviously are feeling what's happening in the rest of the city in the Buckhead area. So crime has risen here, but it's risen largely due to the inequity and inequality issues that are existing in Atlanta. If you ask experts what's driving this sort of thing, they're gonna tell you that it's the isolation that came with the pandemic, piled on top of a lack of mental health services and other public services. It's domestic violence, it's joblessness, it's drugs, it's gangs, it's the prevalence of guns, which we are not talking about enough with this rise in gun violence, why there are so many guns in our community. It's the shutdown of the courts and it's a shortage of police officers. And that's true across the board. So when Buckhead City says they're going to be able to solve this problem by hiring more police officers to serve Buckhead, we actually might be contributing more to the problem than we're helping. The shortage of police officers right now in Atlanta is not because police officers are sitting around at home waiting for a better job offer. We do not have enough of that. So you create a new Buckhead City Police Department, and you're going to start um, essentially poaching police officers from other cities around us, making those areas less safe, and by nature making Buckhead less safe. You're also going to start duplicating a lot of bureaucracy that comes with being able to run a police department. And to your point, Melita, I think what's happening is, particularly in the past year and a half, with the prevalence of Citizens App, Facebook groups, next door, people are sharing information about crime a lot more accessibly than they were say even five years ago. I often see a post on next door 10, 15 times about the same crime, but it makes people feel like that crime happened 15 different times if they see it with that kind of frequency. Even the leadership of Buckhead City loves saying, Buckhead is a war zone. I cannot imagine anything more offensive to veterans and refugees than, call, than calling the safest, most affluent city in Atlanta, part of Atlanta a war zone. It is not. But by playing on those fears and playing on what's been happening to people who are isolated at home and sitting in front of a computer screen, I think it's really stoking fears in this part of Atlanta when, in fact, we are living in the safest part of Atlanta and our responsibility to the rest of the city should be working together to bring down the crime overall in the area. 
Thank you. Representative Oliver, you are an attorney with a long tenure at the General Assembly. Could you talk about just how unusual this proposed de-annexation is in a legal sense as compared to the creation of a new city like Sandy Springs in 2005 or Brookhaven in 2012? Also, former Atlanta Councilwoman Claire Muller has asked for a definition of local legislation and why this legislation is um, being sponsored by legislators outside Atlanta would even be heard. Thank you, Melita. And I also wanna congratulate Melita on receiving the Hannah Solomon Award just this week from the National Council on Jewish Women. Thank you for this invitation. I'm very happy to help us a little bit move into the weeds on both the statutes in relation to annexation, de-annexation and new cities and also the precedents that we have. We're in a very complicated murky area. Uh, we know that there are there is statutory authority, uh, 36, 3622, if anybody wants to look it up, that gives local cities the opportunity, legal authority to de-annex. And there have been a handful of de-annexations done again by local cities. Uh, uh, let me give you a hypothetical. A local city wants to de-annex a strip club, get rid of the litigation, get rid of the oversight, and they just say bye. And that's an example of a city having the specific authority on the statute to do so with 100% agreement of the entity that is being de-annexed. There's also a local legislation route by statute which has really not been used, but was attempted to be used in the creation of the new city of Eagles Landing that the citizens of Eagles Landing appropriately and smartly turned down. When the chaos came forward to create a new city of Eagles Landing, which de-annexed part of Stockbridge, there was a serious discussion about how are we legally entitled to de-annex portions of an existing city that had legal responsibilities for debt, public debt. And that's something that I've really tried to understand in this very complicated arena. I thought, personally, I guessed wrongly, that then Governor Nathan Dale would veto the Stockbridge, the de-annexation and the Eagles Landing creation of New City. He did not, but the voters turned it down. That was a lawsuit that was headed to the Georgia Supreme Court that would take years to resolve. If hypothetically, and I don't think it's likely, although there's a tremendous amount of concern that we all have that the city of quote unquote Buckhead city is the legal name of it, uh, would prevail through the political process, the general and the voters had a chance to vote on it, I think that that would begin litigation over these issues of de-annexation. I have been asking and not getting answers. What is the status of the public debt that will, that today is owned by these folks that live in the alleged map of the new Buckhead City? The debt for pension obligations to the law enforcement, the debt to the Grady uh, Fulton County Hospital Authority, the debt to the airport authority, the debt to Invest Atlanta, the debt to hundreds of millions of dollars that Fulton County Development Authority has given to projects in Buckhead. These questions have no answers. And if you have a de-annexation effort, not ever tested in Georgia, then what you are going to create is chaos, concern over public debt, and most importantly, what I know we'll talk about is the impact of de-annexation of the children that live in the alleged city of Buckhead's entitlement to go to Jackson Elementary, Sutton Middle, uh, Morris Brandon, some of the most popular and healthy uh, public schools in our entire area. We are in a mess if we were serious about this idea, a legal big mess. Well, let's stay in that realm of legal big messes and in the weeds for just a minute with a viewer submitted question from Julie Edelston, who says, um, Representative Oliver, should all the voters in the current city of Atlanta be allowed to vote on this proposal? And if not, why not? The history of creation of new cities is only a referendum for those impacted to create the new city. 
This is a question that's raised every time. I, in my long service on the Government Affairs Committee, when we created the city of Dunwoody, the city of Brookhaven, the city of Stonecrest, the city of Tucker, and others, we have um, not, not, were not passed by uh, the voters. That question comes up every time. But the statute right now for creation of new city only allows people in the city to vote. The law would have to be changed. And historically, that's not been in the interest of the uh, folks that want the city to allow those outside the city to vote. So we're at a stalemate over that important issue. Thank you. Now, pulling back from the weeds to the big picture for a minute, Senator Orock, could you comment on how this process might affect bond ratings? not just for the city of Atlanta, but for the entire state and, and maybe the Atlanta airport, arguably a driver for the state's economic growth. Arguably a driver for the state's economic growth. No question that the Atlanta airport <laughs> is a driver for the state's economic uh, growth. Uh, and there have been uh, schemes and dreams of some folks at the legislature try to rip the Atlanta airport away from uh, the city of Atlanta and the taxpayers uh, who, who, who have paid all these years uh, for that airport and have built its success. I will say to you, and uh, Representative Oliver just put it so well, public debt. Moody's, the bond ratings will be changed. We will slip from our AAA bond rating very, which is the highest, and we're very proud of it. And it means you get the best deals uh, uh, when you when you uh, uh, take out when you finance uh, big public projects. It means you get the best interest rates. You get the best having bond ratings plummet because of this scheme, where it ever took the uh, you know be actualized, uh, is absolutely uh, it's it's idiotic. Who would want that? I mean, I, I frankly see these pot stirrers about this uh, Buckhead City uh, to be absolutely careless and slipshod in the the, the uh, what they're 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 selling a mess of pottage. They're selling a myth to uh, people who live in the Buckhead neighborhood uh, that there's it's going to be Nirvana in the city of Buckhead when we leave Atlanta. That's preposterous. You take the debt with you. You lose the the, um, the um, schools that your children are in. Uh, and, you know, we have, if, we, if there was ever a time in the history of this nation, this state, or this city for people to come together and work shoulder to shoulder to tackle this pandemic era that we're still going through, to tackle the challenges that our children have with the schools being open, shut, it's, uh, infection, uh, hospitals up and down, uh, public public health services, all of these things in high demand. And um, it's the time to come together, not the time to stir the pot and, and build up chaos. Where it, It's something that I recognize that uh, w was done very skillfully by the last guy in the White House. Uh, we need to walk away from that kind of scenario and come together. Thank you. Senator Halpern, let's have you address the often interconnected existing infrastructure, such as underground pipes for water and sewer, which government would end up owning and more importantly, repairing and maintaining these important necessities for quality of life. Yeah, these are these are other outstanding questions that really aren't addressed in the um, feasibility study that the Buckhead Exploratory Committee uh, laid out. Um, in terms of water, I mean, we know that Atlanta owns the water and the sewer. Those are pipes that Atlanta has and that any new city, including a Buckhead city, would need to access. And so in effect, Atlanta really could now add a premium charge to having Buckhead residents access water through their pipes. And we know that through experience with other cities that that is very likely to be what happens. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Sandy Springs has had an issue, this very same issue. And what has happened is that Sandy Springs is caught up in a legal challenge 
and believes that they should have the right water access point themselves. It is caught up in a legal challenge. In the meantime, maintenance needs to happen. Atlanta has not been doing the maintenance because it's caught up in this, embroiled in this legal fight. And so in the meantime, those residents are paying more for their, their a premium for their access to water and sewer, and the maintenance isn't happening as it, as, it, as it might well would in a normal schedule. I think we can easily anticipate these exact same issues with a Buckhead City. The other thing too is parks, right? Atlanta actually, uh, many of the parks that all of us enjoy here in Buckhead, Memorial Park, Chastain Park is two examples. I mean, they're, they're beautiful parks and they are owned by the city of Atlanta. There is no clarity that those park spaces automatically become Buckhead City owned just because the boundaries of uh, Atlanta change at this point. So things like that are, are still big question marks that um, are not addressed and that warrant real dialogue and consideration of impact without just kind of saying, oh, it'll be just fine because they do have significant um, impact on residents. Thank you. Representative Holland, both you and Senator Halpern have school-aged children. Almost all of those who were photographed during a recent high-dollar fundraiser supporting Buckhead City appeared to be well past the age for parenting school children. What are the concerns parents like yourself have about the impact this proposal would have on public education? So, I'm going to dig into a little bit of, of constitutional law here. Constitutionally speaking, if you create a Buckhead City, it cannot create its own school system. Right now, all of the children, the 5,500 some odd public school children who live within the proposed boundary of the city attend Atlanta public schools. But the charter for Atlanta public schools does not allow for APS to educate those children if they no longer live in the city, which they wouldn't anymore if they were suddenly residents of Buckhead City. So barring any other kind of agreement, now those students become the burden for Fulton County public schools. Fulton County schools do not have a single building or piece of infrastructure inside the proposed Buckhead city limits. So now you have the problem that the buildings are here and owned by APS, but Fulton County needs to educate the students. And to be clear, you've got those 5,500 Buckhead students that were in those schools, but you've got 2,400 Atlanta residents attending the schools in Buckhead that wouldn't be included in the proposed city. So you can't even pick up those schools and just come up with an agreement where Fulton County manages them, you'd then be excluding the city of Atlanta kids who were going to those schools. Um, if you do that, you've got the question of, if Fulton County schools bought those buildings, do they take on the debt that was incurred for some of the improvements there, particularly at North Atlanta High School, which I know we can touch on in a minute? Um, what kind of tax increase are we looking at for Fulton County residents if they're going to have to take on the burden of funding the infrastructure improvements for these students who live in Buckhead City? Or are you going to try to go through an intergovernmental agreement with APS to see if APS will continue educating those students? At what cost? What, how long is that legislation going to take or that legal battle going to take to make sure that you iron out all of those details? And then you're gonna have a school board that is serving my child, but I'm not gonna have a vote in the school board elections on who it is that's running the APS schools. On top of all of this, what this is doing is creating instability in general. I bought my house in Buckhead because of the school system it was a part of. I walked to my child's school with him every day. This is a big part of our quality of life here. When you upend that, that upends some of the stability and consistency for families here who might not choose to stay. But more importantly, it's gonna impact the staff and the teachers at the schools who may not wanna continue working there if what school system they're working for is going to be up in the air, or if this is gonna to continue to be legislated. This is going to lead to years of our focus being entirely on ironing out legal problems with the school and not on educating our children, which is supposed to be the first priority. It's going to be an absolute disaster. Any parent in APS I talk to says this is their number one concern about cityhood. Thank you. Senator Halpern, what would you add regarding school concerns since you represent portions of both Buckhead and the city of Atlanta? Yeah, the question of schools, it really, it's one of the most significant that Buckhead City would face. Um, and as Representative Holland said, APS owns all the public schools in the Buckhead area. That's the North Atlanta cluster. It is 13 properties within the proposed city um, boundaries. Uh, and so again, unless 
APS decides to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with Fulton County, all of those school children who are Buckhead, you know, who live in Buckhead, who become part of a Buckhead city will now be part of Fulton County Public Schools. For APS, um, here's what you need to know about APS as a school district. If you take out Buckhead, that school system would be substantially diminished. Uh, and the estimate is that it would be a $232 million loss annually. Um, what we can all agree on for sure is that our schools are incredibly valuable resources, figuratively and literally. The North Atlanta High School itself, it's estimated to be worth $96 million. What is that path forward? Oh, and it's got $74 million in outstanding debt through bonds. So what is the path forward? Is Fulton County going to purchase all of the schools in the district if APS would sell it to them so that Buckhead City students can still attend those schools? And literally, why would they spend hundreds of millions of dollars to accommodate a group of people who have otherwise decided that they want to go it alone? And so these are these are these are some of the big questions about school. And I and I want to just end by saying that the Buckhead Exploratory Committee has been really steadfast in saying, oh, the kids will still go to APS. I just want to say that that is that is not a dependable answer. There are a lot of questions and we keep talking about and using words like chaos and instability, and that is not meant to be hyperbole. There really are so many outstanding questions that have not been sorted. And one, I for one, and my ch I have a child who's also in one of these APS schools, I, I do not feel confident in just, oh, APS will absolutely let our kids continue to go here. There's no real reason for an APS to do that. And also it would be against their charter. Thank you. Senator Orock, could you give us a quick overview of what you believe would happen to the city parks, which were mentioned earlier within the proposed city of Buckhead and, and how that might work out? Well, again, just adding to the litany, the long, long list, peeling back, uh, cutting through these myths that have been spread by this uh, committee that's trying to form a new city. Uh, those parks, those beautiful parks are Atlanta owned. So drawing a line and creating a map, pass a bill and creating a new city, you will not get Chastain Park. It doesn't belong to the city of Buckhead, which is an imaginary, which is a figment. Uh, it, it belongs to Atlanta. Atlanta taxpayer dollars funded that park, uh, uh, along with, uh, you know, so many public amenities, uh, Melita, the uh, senior citizens centers uh, that offer wonderful services and are uh, a great support for our uh, elderly population. Those would not travel with uh, uh, to, to, to suddenly become the property of a, a city of Buckhead. They're the property uh, of uh, Atlanta. They have been, it's Atlanta that's invested in those uh, senior centers. The libraries, good Lord, you know, a fundamental, a fundamental feature uh, in American life and certainly here in Atlanta are wonderful libraries. Some friends of mine just took off to go and vote at the Buckhead Library, cast their ballots for the in the, the uh, municipal elections coming up. Uh, they're out there now voting. We have, we have an investment in libraries across this uh, city that, that is incredible. Well, those libraries don't travel with this uh, new city. So, I mean, what we're, what we're demonstrating to you is, is how much, uh, to you the listeners, is what level of stir and chaos would be created by this. And I'll tell you, talked to a friend of mine yesterday, a Buckhead resident, long time Buckhead resident, uh, um, and long retired. Uh, she got up the other day and a Buckhead City sign was in her yard. So when you hear this talk about all the yard signs are out there in Buckhead, everybody wants it. Somebody put the yard sign in her yard, unbeknownst to her, without her permission, 
So that's just one of the more, uh, one more example of the shenanigans that some of this crowd uh, are engaging in to create an illusion of a tidal wave demand for the illusory city of Buckhead. Well, speaking of shenanigans, <laughs> Representative Oliver, one of the selling points that this proposed new city has been um, giving is that there would be a city court system which would help control crime. And this is misleading, I think, at best. As the only person in Georgia history to have served in both the House and Senate Judiciary Committee as chair, you have special knowledge about these matters. Could you explain the difference between a municipal court system and the superior court system as it might apply in this situation. I also served as a magistrate court judge for DeKalb County, uh, sitting in that, the jail, the DeKalb County jail for on most Friday nights from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. Dealing with uh, law enforcement entities that came from all of the cities of DeKalb County. So I have that perspective of inside the jail and inside the magistrate court for the initial steps of crime. And it's a fascinating, uh, bold, <laughs> ridiculous idea that the Superior Court somehow is going to change Buckhead's control over crime. Um, I currently represent uh, unincorporated DeKalb in four cities. Each of the four cities, Chambly, Brookhaven, Decatur, and Atlanta have their own city system or city magistrate system that in fact feeds misdemeanor and street level traffic crimes into the jail. If there are serious crimes that come in and arrest, then those folks are processed into the county jail, the county superior court, the county magistrate court. The idea that, uh, uh, I'll use an example, the Tucker City Court is all of a sudden uh, in, use, in dealing with traffic offenses or code enforcement offenses or animal control offenses are somehow gonna be a barrier to serious crime is ludicrous. It's just ludicrous. It's a step of intentional uh, misstatement of how government works. I'm really curious if these guys think about how government works on any kind of practical level on a day-to-day -day basis. If City of Buckhead were to be created and have its own municipal court, it would be dealing with traffic offense, watering, code offensive, and dog cases. In no way is it going to be dealing with any felonies, any felonies, or anything related to violent crime. Let me say one more thing about the school chaos. Uh, when the City of Atlanta annexed 743 acres in DeKalb County uh, a couple of years ago, basically the Emory campus and Choa and CDC campus. It involved four to six children who were eligible for DeKalb County schools and were moved hypothetically into city schools and about $3 million of property tax and a fire station. That took two years of litigation, mediation, new local legislation to correct what was pretty, pretty not thought out and some bad behavior on that annexation. The idea that the city of Buckhead proponents are gonna involve in a massive amount of ridiculous time wasting, money wasting chaos is just ludicrous to me. Thank you. Senator Halpern, let's shift to taxes. What kind of property tax increases might residents in both of these areas face if this proposal happens to be approved? And it sounds like the lawyers would be making a lot of money off what happens. Yeah, so I mean, in establishing cityhood, I mean, there are a lot of folks, lawyers included, who do make a lot of money. You've got consultants, you've got lawyers, there's a lot of startup costs associated with a new city. And so it is almost certain that Buckhead residents, Buckhead area residents would pay higher taxes due to one, the need to refinance debt assumed for from existing infrastructure that we've already been talking about and also that startup spending. Um, I'll give you this analogy. When you, um, like, because Buckhead keeps saying that they want a divorce. Well, when you have a divorce, it may mean that you don't have to see each other anymore unless you have children, which we've been talking about the schools. So there is children, 
But also in Georgia, you don't get to walk away from a marriage debt free. Whatever debt has been assumed in that marriage, you must carry with you or split. So the idea that no debt will be um, incurred by Buckhead City related to bonds that the city of Atlanta has and the success of those bonds that Buckhead itself has enjoyed um, is, is just, it's not realistic. Um, so both the city of Atlanta and Buckhead residents can expect to see taxes raised. Obviously, um, the city of Atlanta's taxes could be raised because they still have their services that they have to now uh, provide with less of a re residential base to do that for. And there is potential also that Fulton County taxes generally would also have to, to see an increase. Because again, if Fulton County has to take on any uh, debt or any purchases, like we talked before, would Fulton County purchase the schools from it, APS if they would even allow for that? There is potential for taxes to rise for Fulton County overall as well. So uh, de-annexation generally is not the answer. I too underscore the fact that working together to solve the grievances would be much better. And a reminder too that Buckhead, Atlanta's success, Buckhead has enjoyed and, and Buckhead's success, Atlanta has enjoyed. Like the winning formula here has been that together everybody succeeds. Um, decoupling Buckhead from Atlanta really does put an additional burden on all the residents, county, city, new city, uh, for grievances that really can be managed. Um, and we've got new leadership. I think Senator Orock just mentioned that she's got friends who just went up to, to Buckhead Library to vote. We are right here at the precipice of electing a new mayor, a new city council president, and a new city council, new leadership that we all can work with to resolve the challenges that we're facing. Thank you. Representative Holland, debt has been mentioned. And what about the debt associated with pensions for city of Atlanta employees? And, and whether even all of those employees would still have a job if the city is divided. Could you address that very briefly? Absolutely. So let's, let's go back to law enforcement. Let's talk about supporting our police officers. One of the most important ways that we can recruit and retain good law enforcement is to offer good competitive pay and a great competitive pension package. And that is part of what we've promised to our Atlanta police officers. That pension debt can't just be wiped away if Buckhead City folks say, well, we're making our own police department. We shouldn't have to pay that pension anymore. In fact, leadership for Buckhead City has said, we will take on that pension debt. Of course, we'll keep that obligation. So now residents of Buckhead City are paying for the pension plans for the police force that they're hiring and the police force that's still at the APD. Teachers, same problem. One of the ways we recruit and retain fabulous talent for teachers is by offering those pensions. So pensions are an incredibly important part of us making sure we have great civic civil servants who are working with us and we can't walk away from that. But a newly formed Buckhead City will wind up paying for it twice when they're paying for the pensions of city employees that aren't even part of the employees that are serving the newly formed Buckhead City. And to your point about job development and job creation and economics, the potential is if we take the tax dollars that Buckhead City is paying and we move them out of the city of Atlanta, the city very well may face the choice to have to lay off city workers to be able to make up that shortfall of taxes. So what we're actually doing is reducing um, um, the jobfulness of the city of Atlanta, and we should be trying to do the exact opposite. Thank you so much. Now, Representative Oliver, before she ever ran for office, former Representative Stephanie Stuckey served as your legislative assistant and staff attorney for the Judiciary Committee. Overnight, she posted several images for the existing city of Buckhead, Georgia in Morgan County between Atlanta and Athens on social media. Granted, this Buckhead has a population of only 189 in the 2020 census, but it is an existing incorporated entity. Does state law allow two municipalities in Georgia with the same name? No, is the simple answer, no. And therefore the legislation that's been introduced refers to what we're referring to as city of Buckhead as Buckhead City. 
they've changed the name. So the official name of a uh, hypothetical new city of Buckhead would be Buckhead City. Uh, Stephanie is a native Georgian. I'm a native Georgian. You are too. We love this history and all these little towns across Georgia still have legal relevance. And the city of Buckhead out in Morgan County has legal rel relevance to this debate we're having today. Thank you. Senator Orock, what are the next legislative steps for this Buckhead City proposal and how do you see it faring when the General Assembly reconvenes in January? Thank you, Melita. We're going into a special session uh, in November. We'll be in there right up uh, till Thanksgiving uh, as, as we redraw uh, the uh, lines of the congressional districts and the state Senate and state house districts. So that will be coming up, but these, these proponents, these pot stirrers who are selling, uh, you know, a, a, a real bill of goods to people, they've, um, uh, they're going to have a hearing while we're over there at the Capitol uh, in the Senate where there's been no bill introduced, but they're going to have uh, a hearing. They've gotten uh, their buddies uh, to grant them a hearing uh, in the state Senate. So you'll, you'll be seeing that. Uh, then we come back in, and but, but there, there'll be no votes taken on it. That's not on the agenda for the special session. Uh, but uh, but there will be publicity. There'll be publicity, and 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 I, and I would dare say more uh, more uh, misconstrued uh, uh, non facts uh, spread around. Uh, come January, we're in session. There's a bill that got dropped in the house maybe two minutes before we closed out. Uh, a, back in uh, the spring session of the General Assembly. So the 22 session of the General Assembly starts second Monday in January. Uh, that, that bill will uh, be pushed forward by the advocates. They're very busy rounding up, uh, making it a litmus test for Republicans to that you gotta vote for this Buckhead secession or you're not a true uh, Trumper and you might get punished back home uh, when you go home, if you don't vote for this Buckhead secession, that's that's exactly what is happening. It's becoming a litmus test of are you faithful to the big lie and to Trump and and uh, now, but but I'll, I'll say to you, as that bill moves through the process, uh, it's got a bill to, to become law it has to pass the uh, committee in the House, then go to the floor, get a, a, a majority vote in the floor of at least 91 votes, and then come to the Senate before uh, uh, the, the, de the deadline for getting bills across to us. And then the Senate would uh, vote on that bill, amend it, uh, defeat it, uh, vote it up, vote it down, send it back. And if that bill gets to the governor's desk, uh, if both houses agree on a version of a Buckhead City bill, uh, that is the majority that, you know, we won't be voting for that. Uh, we'll be trying to educate the public about the, uh, how wrongheaded this is. And then the, the, the bill were it to pass, goes to the governor's desk, the governor signs it. And then there's uh, an election. It's put on, it's, it'll be put on a ballot, uh, fall of, of 22. And when we're, when we're voting for our governor, our constitutional officers and all our seats. And, and, and the way is, as Representative Vollers described, the way that, uh, the, the way that the law reads now, the only people that could vote on it are people that live in within the map area that's designated as the new city. Now, what what my what my sincere hope is is that the facts can be made clear to the people in Buckhead, who are smart people, educated people, aware people, engaged people, involved pe people who care about the same things all the rest of us care about. You know, uh, public safety, security, education, uh, well, the well-being of their families and their community. They will be distressed and disturbed were this to become the reality. You have heard all the layers of the litigation the complications, uh, I won't reiterate them all, but these are the things that the uh, residents, potential residents of a new Bucket City are not being told. So don't be flim flammed. Don't, don't swallow a bill of goods and live to regret it. That is, that is uh, were, that bill, were, were that bill to become law and be on a ballot uh, 
2022, November, um, vote it down. Won't Damn. serve the interests of our communities, our families, our schools, our city, or our state. Thank you, ma'am. Senator Halpern, viewer Sarah LeClerc of Atlanta asked what institutional changes you might identify to help racially desegregate the many communities in Atlanta, which are seemingly somewhat segregated. Your thoughts? So this is a, it, it's a, it's an interesting question. And, and just to tie it to this topic of this de-annexation, one of the things that has been happening in terms of kind of national media news outlets in reporting around this cityhood movement is that, um, you know, like the headlines are, wealthy white neighborhood wants to leave black city. And so, um, you know, it is being framed by that nationally, which is already, you know, which is, which, it, which hurts our reputation already that alone. Uh, and of course it, it will be up to the folks who are really pushing for the cityhood movement to disprove that headline. Um, and, 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 and show us that it really is leadership and mismanagement, as they have said, that are the concerns. Um, but to, to, I think if we're going, first we have to recognize that if we're ever gonna end both the geographic and that's neighborhood and then the economic kind of segregation that we do see here in Atlanta, we have to first acknowledge that met, much of that happens because of policy and the kinds of policies that are put into place. And so it really, it's been policy that has created most of the inequity that we continue to see to this day, even in 2021. So I, I think about it and I believe that it's mostly a question of resources. So we need to invest more in ensuring that no child grows up in poverty. Atlanta is one of those cities where if you are born into poverty, you have exactly a 4% chance in your lifetime to ever get out of poverty. Um, it should not be that um, your zip code and your family's income absolutely determines the trajectory of the rest of your life. So we need to invest more in, in ensuring that people aren't growing up in policy and that the resources are provided across every neighborhood in the city. We need to make sure that early childhood care and education and a high quality public school education are available to everybody. Um, that everyone has health care, that everyone can eat three hot meals a day. I mean, these are many of the issues that we talk about uh, oftentimes in the state legislature and try to push forward. Um, but more resources do create more opportunity. More opportunity creates more mobility. And it's work for Atlanta to do. We talk a lot about housing affordability, um, but Atlanta is one of the most economically unequal kind of cities in the country. And so real work and intentionality has to be given to changing the trajectory that we're on. Thank you. To close out today, I want to give Senator Orock and Representative Oliver some last words. Years ago, Nan and I were talking about the work of Georgia Winlist to recruit, train, and elect new legislators. Nan told me, keep it up. Keep sending us those reinforcements. Mary Margaret, you have shared similar sentiments over the years. Could the two of you please share your thoughts on the continuing need for reinforcements and electing the new generation of legislators like Representative Holland from 2018 and Senator Halperin from the 2020 class? Representative Oliver, you go first. Thank you, Melita, for this opportunity to get in the weeds about Buckhead City, what would be the new legal name, hypothetically. Even though I'm a Georgia native, I didn't come to the state capitol till I was after 30 years old. I went down there as a, a, a legal services lawyer to work on a particular bill. And there were, at that time, uh, this was a uh, very long time ago, or 80s, uh, there were uh, fewer than 10 women. They were all uh, married. None of, them were, none of them worked outside the home. One of them had uh, young children, Kathy Steinberg. 
The reality today, in part thanks to WinList and the emerging of women who really understand that politics matter, uh, the diversity of the women in the General Assembly is just so tremendously important. The corporate experiences of Sonia and Betsy are examples of the new legislative women coming to the Capitol that bring an entirely uh, diverse and high level uh, set of new skills. We have a nursing professor. Uh, we have an epidemiologist, PhD from CDC. We have a tremendously diverse, accomplished, successful group of new women legislators that have come in and done a tremendous amount of work. It's very, very encouraging to me to see new troops showing up at the session uh, who are operating in a cooperative way, much more so historically than men have who are working on issues that relate to the things people, real families care about, trying to get their children to school on time, environment, quality of air, education. Uh, it's been a real thrilling transition and I'm very grateful to WinList for your contributions. Thank you so much. Senator Orock. That puts a smile on my face to hear uh, Mary Margaret's uh, account. And uh, I do want to let everybody know that the Georgia Municipal Association is opposing this Buckhead City uh, creation. You need to know that, you need to check in with them and they represent uh, all of the towns and cities uh, across the state of Georgia and they know what they're talking about. Um, I would echo the sentiments of Mary Margaret. Uh, I, I met Mary Margaret. <laughs> when I was elected. She was down there as a, uh, uh, from legal aid, you know, uh, working on issues uh, legal aid has done so beautifully on before she uh, ran for election. And um, it was fair, it was slim pickings back in those days, Melita. Uh, and uh, you and I both remember when, when uh, we con convened an effort to let's build, let's build the capacity and the resources to support uh, pro-choice Democratic women getting elected, right? Well, look where we are today. And I, 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 I'm I, singing from the same songbook that you just heard from Mary Margaret. The wonderful talent, you, you, you just heard uh, Sonia Halpern and um, uh, Betsy here, Betsy just, they're new leaders, they're trusted, they're tried and true from a lifetime of experience and they're building the brain trust uh, is, my, is my strong uh, belief. Uh, and the proof of the pudding's in the eating, and, and you can see it right here, that um, the work that, that Winless has done has been decisive uh, here in Georgia in changing what the General Assembly looks like. And the work's not done. The work's not done. Uh, uh, we uh, are looking ahead to a road paved with great intentions and more female talent coming into the General Assembly to uh, wrestle with these complex and challenging questions and doing our very best to represent the people that sent us there. Thank you so much. Thank you, all four of you. We appreciate the time our busy panelists took for joining us today. Georgia Winless depends upon the generous support of our donor network to continue our important work to change the face of power by electing more women like the four you have met today to legislative seats in statewide office please consider supporting our powerful network of leaders who are working to finish the job of turning Georgia blue in 2022. So long as the Georgia GOP maintains its trifecta of state's power, proposals like cityhood for Buckhead will continue to be discussed, often as a distraction for galvanizing the shrinking Georgia GOP base. Our mission for 21 years has been changing the face of power and indeed our efforts have dramatically increased the percentage of women, especially democratic women serving in the General Assembly. More information is on our website, www.gawinlist.com. Contributions to our annual fund giving circles support informative webinar programs like the one today and the training, recruitment, election and reelection of women like the 45 Winlist endorsed women currently serving. We are very excited about the candidates who are now demonstrating interest in statewide office and open legislative seats for the 2022 election cycle. Please consider sharing today's program with a friend or two who might enjoy watching and joining our network. 
Programs are archived on our Facebook page, website, and YouTube channel. Stay informed about the exciting work of our winning women by following Georgia Win List across Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for a perspective you may not see elsewhere. Thanks for joining us today. Please stay safe and let's all wear pearls to cheer on the Atlanta Braves. Best wishes.